Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's live broadcast, CRISPR-Cas Assisted Genetics in Intestinal Organoids, presented by Dr. Bong Kyung Koo, the group leader at the Institute of Molecular Biotechnology, IMBA. I am Michelle Ashton of LabRoots, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. Today's educational web seminar is brought to you by LabRoots and sponsored by GenScript. For more information on our sponsor, please visit www.genscript.com. Now let's get started. I would like to remind everyone that this event is interactive. We encourage you to participate by submitting as many questions as you want at any time you want during the presentation. To do so, simply type them into the Ask a Question box and click on the Send button. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. If you have trouble seeing or hearing the presentation, click on the support tab found at the top right of the presentation window or report your problem by clicking on the ask a question box located on the far left of your screen. This presentation is educational and thus offers continuing education credits. Please click on the continuing education credits tab located at the top right of the presentation window and follow the process to obtain your credits. I'd like to now introduce our speaker, Dr. Bong Kyung Koo. For a complete biography on our speaker, please visit the biography tab at the top of your screen. BK, you may now begin your presentation. Right. Thank you, uh, everybody, for joining the uh, seminar today. Uh, today, I'm going to talk about uh, organoid as a model system, and uh, we'll basically introduce uh, some genetic engineering tools so that you can utilize organoid as a model system in your laboratory. Uh, first of all, uh, I'd like you to uh, pay attention to the picture that you see now in the first slide. So these are uh, mouse intestinal organoids uh, with many uh, budding structure. So uh, there are many budding structure around. Uh, in the middle where you see this dark area, we have uh, differentiated cells. And in this budding structure, we have uh, proliferating progenitors as well as stem cells. Um, to understand this organoid system uh, nicely well, I think it is very important to understand uh, the gut biology. So I will start uh, introducing how the stem cell in the gut is working, and then I will move on to the next. Okay, so uh, in the gut, we have uh, two distinctive structures. One is called a stylus, where we have uh, many absorptive cells and cells that are secreting mucins and so on. And these are mostly important for digestion function. Uh, whereas uh, these cells that are located in the villus, they are completely lost within a week of time, meaning that the entire tissue needs to be regenerated uh, in a weekly basis. And to have uh, such a regenerative capacity, we do need to have uh, adult stem cells that can replace this tissue and uh, over the many uh, decades, uh, people were wondering where the stem cells are. So uh, when I was a PhD student, uh, no one actually knew the exact location of stem cells. But now, uh, by some time in 2007 and 8, uh, we got to know the real identity of the stem cell. So basically, stem cells are located in this crypt structure at the very base of the structure. And uh, what we know now is that this adult stem cell uh, can give a rise to stem cell cells, which means self-renewal. And they can also differentiate into uh, four different cell types, such as uh, absorptive enterocytes, goblet cells, endocrine cells, and pani cells. Um, so conceptually, uh, we already had a, an idea of adult stem cells about you know, 15 years ago, uh, but uh, at the time, uh, nobody knew about the exact identity, as I mentioned. The very important um, finding uh, at the time that was made by Nick Baca, a former colleague of mine uh, in the Netherlands, uh, he uh, generated uh, LDR5 uh, GP knocking mouse, uh, with which uh, he was able to visualize this LDR5 positive stem cells uh, in the mouse small intestine. So this LDR5 is a, a genetic marker uh, which labels the stem cell population. Uh, so Nick uh, not only labeled them, but also introduced uh, a CRE-ER recombinase in the downstream of LDR5. So 
I don't have a, a slide for the details, but I can tell you how the uh, experiment was working. So conceptually, it's very easy to understand. So what Nick has done is uh, he had a genetic labeling system uh, that only works in the stem cell expressing LDR5. So he marked his LDR5 positive cells to change their color in blue. And this uh, changes of color is triggered by genetic change. So all the progeny that comes out from the stem cell will take over the same uh, features so that uh, they show the blue color uh, in the daughter cell. So on day five, you see this nice uh, ribbon formation coming out from the bottom of the crypt. And this continues to uh, the villus, if you look at the uh, uh, image on day 60. And this all again continues up to six months of time. And Nick actually checked the same in a mouse where he was following this uh, stem cell activity over one year of time, which is almost equivalent to the mouse lifespan. So by doing so, he found that the very first uh, LDR5 positive cells that are residing in the base of the crypt is indeed a stem cell that can replenish the tissue for such a long time. And at the same time, uh, he also labeled uh, other cell types in this blue ribbon to identify that the stem cells that were uh, initially labeled in the bottom of the crypt uh, could generate a uh, goblet cell, that you can see this with a uh, white arrow head. In between these two goblet cells, we have enterocytes. There are also panel cells. You can also see enteroendocrine cells. So all this data meaning, uh, means that uh, the firstly labeled LGF5 positive stem cell is the uh, real stem cell population uh, of the intestine. So this was published in 2007, which is like 13 years ago from now. Uh, but after that, uh, since we have identified the stem cells in the gut, uh, we were wondering how to uh, grow them uh, in vitro. So the next question uh, that our lab had at the time uh, was carried over, uh, out by Toshiro Sato. So Toshi had a brilliant idea that he wanted to uh, grow the stem cells out of the gut. Uh, in a plastic dish uh, to be able to show that uh, the stem cells that are functioning in the gut is indeed has a stem cell function uh, in vitro as well. But in vitro uh, condition is different from in vivo condition, so he failed uh, multiple times uh, in setting up the culture condition. Uh, after many trials, he uh, basically found a very magical combination, which is a growth factor combination, such as uh, e com uh, combined by EGF or mitogen, login to uh, block BMP signal, and r responding for uh, activating uh, wind signaling. And, and for the, uh, in addition to these three growth factors, he also found another very important ingredient, which is the extra extracellular matrix. So uh, after adding this single stem cell isolated from the gut, that expresses this nice LGR5 GP. Uh, he embedded them firstly in uh, matrigel extracellular matrix and gave a media containing EGF, login, and arspondin. And after that, he found that the single stem cell uh, could grow out into this cystic structure. And within about two weeks of time, he again found them to growing into this uh, budding structure. And after they formed this budding structure, he performed histology and found that the budding is looking like a, a, a cryptic structure, uh, which is very similar to the in vivo counterpart that you see uh, on the left side. Uh, in addition, uh, Toshiro Sato found that uh, this complicated uh, budding structure can be uh, split into pieces, seeded again in the matri gel, uh, and if you give a media again, and they could grow uh, again and again with a weekly uh, splitting activity. So that he was able to culture them for longer than a year of time without uh, major genetic changes. And he also found them to be able to make uh, self-organizing structures. So this was the first uh, organoid culture that was derived from uh, adult stem cells. So when he examined the structure more carefully, he found that although it was uh, initiated from single LGR5 positive stem cells, 
we could find that uh, LDR5 positive cells are located in every uh, budding structure of the crypt, uh, of the organoid. He also found that uh, there are many EDU positive uh, cells uh, in the budding structures, meaning that these are proliferating progenitors. And not only this stem cell and progenitors, he also found uh, villain positive enterocytes, mucin 2 positive doublet cells, lysozyme positive panet cells, and chromogranin A positive enterocrine cells, meaning that the four cell types that we can normally find from the uh, intestinal epithelium. So he started from single stem cell and found them to be uh, multiple stem cells as well as progenitor and four different cell types. So this uh, simple experiment uh, indeed showed the stem cell activity of uh, LDR5 positive cells again in vitro. Uh, but the interesting point is that by doing so, uh, Toshiro was able to establish the organic culture for the first time. So um, the, this is the uh, schematic drawing to show how organism is looking. Uh, when it becomes fully mature, we have this uh, budding structure, which we call crypt domain. And in between this budding structure, we have a villous domain where we have many uh, differentiated cell types. So now we are going to uh, look at a movie uh, where uh, I can show you how organoids are growing uh, in, the, in real time. Okay, so I hope that everybody has seen the video. So in the video, uh, you were seeing a cystic structure maturing into the budding structure, and that takes about a week of time. And uh, if you uh, split them by giving a shear force with a, a pipette, uh, then uh, each budding structure can be seeded back to the material, and if you give a media, then they can form a cyst structure again, and the single cyst will become a uh, budding structure again, again within a week of time. So this means that in a week, uh, a single bud will become a budding structure containing five to six buds around. So if you repeat, it for, if repeat this for about a year of time, this means that you can achieve uh, five to uh, 50 seconds of expansion, uh, which means that now the uh, adult stem cell based organ systems can also be utilized as a you know, very nice uh, source for uh, adult cells uh, in vitro. And this technology has now been applied to uh, multiple organs in the mouse body as well as in the human body. So this is an example of human. And now we can grow uh, many uh, endodon derived tissue uh, from the human, uh, <clears throat> human body as an organoid. So this now gives you an opportunity to utilize a uh, human organoid or mouse organoid for your own uh, biological studies. And today I'm going to emphasize that uh, not only the culture system, but also the genetic uh, engineering tools are completely ready for you to uh, utilize. So here I'm comparing uh, some of the model systems that are uh, very uh, popular in our field. So uh, you know that there are uh, worm and flies, which is invertebrate model systems. Um, many of you might have been working with the mouse and uh, zebrafish. I myself have been working extensively with the mouse as well as the uh, cancer cell lines. If I compare mouse and cell lines, then the very obvious point is that in the mouse, since we can observe uh, phenotype from, uh, by looking at the mutant physiology, and uh, uh, histology, we can uh, sometimes directly show the <clears throat> in vivo function of a gene. But uh, to be able to do so in the cell line is not so easy as it is in the mouse. Whereas uh, even after CRISPR revolution, I think genetic manipulation is too uh, difficult in mouse. And uh, mouse is not a system where you can do uh, screening of chemical compounds and so on. Whereas uh, cell lines 
gives an opportunity for us to, to do a very easy gene of expression and knockdown. And the screening is also mainly uh, performed with the cell line system. So one thing that I want to emphasize is that mouse and the cell line has a very clear pros and cons. And the organ system is probably a new system uh, which combines the positive side of the both. So you can observe the in vivo phenotype and you can at the same time perform uh, genetic manipulation as well as the uh, chemical screening and many other things. So I made another summary. So here you have an organoid and it's really up to your imagination. Uh, this is a ex vivo system where you can observe in vivo phenotype. It's an ever-expanding system. You can even try to cryopreserve uh, them as a cell line, uh, as if they are like a cell line. Uh, after you uh, finish your holiday, you can come back to the lab. You can sew them and restart your experiment. So uh, this you know, gives you a lot of freedom. Uh, it's very uh, tiny culture so that uh, ligand and inhibitor treatment is very easy and you just need to use a very small amount and you can observe the phenotypical changes. They are very close from us, so you can either use mouse organoid or you can even try to use human organoid to study human biology. However, uh, when I started working with organoids about 10 years ago, so that's like uh, 2009 or 2010, uh, we didn't have uh, uh, any uh, genetic tools uh, with which we can uh, properly uh, use organoids for biological studies. So during the last 10 years, my main focus was uh, how we can do the genetic control in the organoid system. So I made a very important two slides, uh, which might be you know, the most important two slides uh, that you want to see today. So these are the one of the two. So uh, I would say this is organoid genetic one. So these are the work that I did during my postdoctoral time in the Hans Klebers lab. Uh, here I listed three main uh, technologies. The first one is about uh, the util uh, <clears throat> using by using the uh, retro or lentivirus, uh, one can introduce uh, gene of expression or gene knockdown in organoid system. So uh, the method was described in this Nature Method paper in 2011. After that. Uh, we wanted to uh, generate uh, bacteria artificial chromosome transgenic organoid, uh, which might be important for uh, live imaging and other uh, applications. Uh, this was published in CLOS1 in 2013. Uh, one very important aspect of this uh, publication is that uh, we figured out how to introduce very large DNA segments uh, into an organoid system because bacteria artificial chromosome often uh, had uh, around 100 to 150 kb of length. So uh, figuring out how to uh, perform uh, liposuction and uh, other types of electroporation in organoid was very important to achieve the next uh, uh, project. So the next project was how we can utilize a CRISPR-Cas system in the organoid uh, so that we can achieve gene knockout or even uh, gene knock-ins in the organoid system and this was established on the same year when we had a CRISPR-Cas uh, introduced in 2013. And after that, uh, we further optimized uh, the <clears throat> method. So uh, Toshiro Sato uh, introduced a very nice electroporator called NEPA21 in Nature Protocols in 2015. Uh, this is a very uh, nice method. So not only my lab, but also many other labs are utilizing uh, the same system with a very similar protocol. So I really recommend you to think about using it if you like to work with the organoid. Uh, next, uh, when I was in Cambridge, I started working with a piggyback system because this is a, uh, a transposon-based system, but it works pretty much like a retro or lentivirus so that uh, anything that is in between the two ITR can nicely be copied into the genome upon uh, transfection. So, and another thing is retro or lentivirus, they have a uh, problem with the capacity so that up to seven to eight KB of DNA segment is the maximum uh, size that you can transfer with the retrovirus. Whereas in piggyback, 
we do not have a, such a limitation. So uh, many of the labs who got to know this is now utilizing this feedback system. So this is also another very important uh, technology that I really recommend for you to use. Uh, next, we also figured out how to generate conditional knockout uh, using uh, organoid, and this was introduced uh, by my lab uh, in 2017 in Nature Method. So today I'm going to show you a few examples. Firstly, uh, this is the example of the first uh, GP uh, transgenic organoid uh, shining nicely in green. Uh, initially, it was not uh, I thought it to be very easy uh, to achieve, but uh, that was not really uh, the case because uh, virus entered uh, via the luminal side of the organoid. So we had to uh, grow the organoid in a cystic structure first, and then after digesting them to expose the luminal side uh, toward to the virus, and then we could really uh, achieve the virus infection, and after that we could grow them uh, with a viral uh, infection. So uh, this uh, whole protocol uh, has taken me about a uh, year of time to achieve the full optimization. Uh, but now this is you know, fully uh, described with the, also with the protocol paper. So if you search for my name uh, in PubMed, then I, I think that you can easily find those uh, protocols to utilize this system. Uh, next one is an example of a uh, piggyback, no, this a uh, bacterial artificial chromosome transgenic organoid where the red pineal cells are shining in, uh, in red. Uh, so the movie will be showing how the red pineal cells is growing uh, together with the organoid. Okay, I hope that you uh, have seen the uh, pineal cells being formed already in the cystic structure and later ended up in the uh, tip of the body structure when, uh, because they uh, secret winds and they have the organizer function for the body information. Uh, in this slide, I wanted to show you that CRISPR-Cas technology can be uh, utilized to generate mutant organoids. So these are the first CRISPR mutants uh, that, I, that I made. So uh, on the left, we have a mouse organoid uh, with a body structure, but after having uh, have lost the uh, APC, they now have this cystic structure. Uh, and the same happens with the human ones. So normally they grow with the body, but after losing APC, they grow with this uh, nice cystic structure. When, it, when we examined the uh, targeted sequence, uh, we were able to uh, so this in the formation, uh, suggesting that uh, CRISPR-Cas works pretty well uh, with the organic culture if you know how to uh, properly uh, transfect them with the CRISPR tools. So today, uh, for the main part, I prepared two uh, <clears throat> stories. The first one is a, a lady, an old one, but I think it's a very nice one for you to know. So this is about the first example of uh, CRISPR gene correction. Uh, that we tried in the uh, adult human uh, organoid. And the second one is how we can utilize CRISPR uh, system to perform uh, gRNA screening in organoids. So, firstly, about gene correction. The cystic fibrosis is a very common genetic disease, uh, especially in Caucasian population. And especially in the Netherlands, uh, there are many patients. Uh, suffering from cystic fibrosis, and uh, when we were uh, when we got to know the CRISPR-Cas technology in 2013, we thought that maybe we can make uh, a proof of concept uh, experiment by com by applying the CRISPR-Cas technology to organoid technology, so that we can uh, generate a precise gene correction of a cystic fibrosis positive gene uh, to cure the patient's organoid. So the very first thing we do was uh, find uh, establishing a, 
uh, organoids from uh, cystic fibrosis patients. So as you see on the left, uh, normal human control organoids, if you treat them with toxicoline, then this triggers cyclic AMP activation in the cell, uh, which triggers water influx to the lumen so that uh, they will uh, blow up like a balloon. Uh, whereas in the CF patient organoid, since the uh, channel activity of CFTR is gone, so that uh, even after toxicoline treatment, they cannot show any balloon-like phenotype. So the main task that I had at the time was figuring out where in the CFTR we have a mutation and designing a gRNA and the targeting vector uh, with which we can uh, cure the genetic scar to have the correct sequence. So, uh, so we, we found that the uh, uh, mutant organoid had a, a famous mutation, which is phenylalanine fiber-8 deletion. We designed two guide RNA. One attacks the uh, mutant site, another one attacks the, uh, the site of so puromycin insertion site. Uh, the reason to use the two gRNAs separately was to uh, just to achieve a higher efficiency of uh, success rate. And uh, targeting vector has the CTT uh, correction as well as the silent mutation, meaning that uh, this changes the uh, nucleotide sequence, but it doesn't change the amino acid sequence, so the protein will have no uh, problem, but this functions as a, a fingerprint that I can embed it in the targeted vector. So by looking at the silent mutation, one can understand that uh, we have really done the uh, gene correction. So, so what we have done is, uh, after figuring out this uh, muta mutation part of the uh, patient organoid, we designed this targeting vector and the gRNA and transfected them all together with Cas9 in the organoid with the hope that uh, we can get some recombinant. And that works very well. So here you see that uh, the missing CTT is back to normal. So you see the CTT is nicely uh, back in the yellow mark in the corrected organoid, whereas in the wild type and the parent mutant, the blue part shows uh, nucleotide sequence CA. It now changed into CC. So this is the uh, fingerprint that we inserted it in, which functions as a, a silent mutation. So if you see that, uh, I, I think you can believe that we indeed did a gene correction. And after that, we found that uh, mutant organoid is now nicely responding to the post calling treatment so that we were able to observe the balloon-like phenotype. So uh, with that, we had a nice paper out, and uh, I'm going to show you a movie that summarizes uh, the work. Okay, I hope you enjoyed the movie. Um, and this work has a very uh, good implication. So uh, a lot of people would know that uh, IPS technology will eventually help humans to have a uh, autologous cell therapy at some point. Uh, but I can also tell you that the autologous cell therapy can also be performed with organoids in the near future. Uh, if I compare the two technologies, uh, I would say that organoid forms a shortcut because in case of IPS technology, you have to reprogram your somatic cells firstly to IPS cells. Uh, this is an error-prone step, so you have to really find out the correctly reprogrammed IPS cells. And after that, you have to undergo, uh, this cell should undergo uh, gene correction. And, and then the corrected IPS cells should be used for uh, full differentiating, differentiation into the uh, target cell types, which can then be transplanted back to the human. So this undergoes overall three major steps that are technically very challenging. Whereas 
uh, in case of organoid, uh, as soon as you isolate the organoid from a patient, you just need to do the gene correction, and uh, uh, the resulted uh, corrected organoid can then be used uh, cell therapy directly to human. So in this case, there is a just one step to overcome. Uh, the reason that organoid has not been used in cell therapy is because of the uh, extracellular matrix that we are using. We currently use uh, matrigel for most of the culture, and this is a, a, a material which is not fully defined, so it doesn't uh, comply with a, a good manufacturer uh, protocol that we have to achieve for uh, human therapy. So if somebody uh, figure out figure out how to generate a synthetic uh, material for the organic culture, I think this can be uh, achieved in the near future. Okay, so I will then move on to the uh, second topic. So this is the work that is currently being done in my lab, and it is about how to utilize the CRISPR-Cas uh, uh, <clears throat> CRISPR gRNA screening uh, in organic culture. And this is a, uh, an interesting problem because uh, if you think, if you look at some of the um, gRNA screening methods that are published out there, you see that most of them are about genome-wide screening with uh, many, many genes to be involved. Whereas uh, in organoids, this is a miniature culture so that uh, we have a, uh, some capacity problem so that the maximum culture we can achieve with organoids is probably uh, up to like hundreds well. So uh, the idea was how to compromise the uh, gRNA uh, library as small as possible that can be uh, carried over by organoids with a maximum size of culture. So we were uh, adjusting the two in a way that we can really find the well-matched uh, size of the two. And we came up with an idea that uh, just about uh, four to 5,000 gRNAs is the one that we can really handle with a large organic culture. And to also achieve a higher uh, discovery rate, uh, we designed our gRNAs in a way that we can uh, put two gRNAs at the same time. And this allows us to knock out genes in an uh, in a interesting way. So uh, as you know that uh, when... Um, vertebrates evolved from invertebrate, there has been uh, full genome duplication two times. So this means that in fly, uh, one gene one function is true, almost. However, in the most of the vertebrate system, there are multiple genes, at least four genes or three genes, that are uh, sharing some of the gene function. So these are called as a paralog, and this paralog problem is a very uh, heavy problem in the mouse genetics as well as in the zebrafish and also in humans. So it, this means that if you knock out, even if you knock out one gene, there might be another gene that can compensate the loss. So this uh, makes our genetic study very difficult. And to circumvent this problem, we design, we use this dual guide system in a way that a single gene can be attacked by two gRNA, then the efficiency will be higher. For the dual genes, uh, each of the gRNA can attack uh, both genes. In case of trio, we assume that one of the three genes might be a pseudogene, so that by attacking either AB or BC or CA, we can achieve a very nice uh, gene knockout of the of the trio gene. And we also achieved uh, uh, tried a similar approach for quadro. In this case, we have to cover uh, six different combinations. So uh, we were thinking about uh, targeting uh, ring domain containing E3 ubiquitin ligase uh, with our gRNA system, so which ended up for 300 tangents with 3,840 3, uh, gRNA. So this is the uh, pipeline of the uh, screening uh, system. Firstly, uh, we have to isolate organoids from uh, a mutant mouse containing uh, Cre and uh, Cas9. So with the Cre activation, we can activate Cas9. Then you see this nice green uh, fluorescence. So all these organoids are expressing Cas9 very nicely. We firstly expand them, and then we introduce all this gRNA library 
uh, encoding almost 4,000 gRNAs in a dual guide system that are attacking uh, 300 resins uh, to uh, compensate the redundancy problems. And uh, after that, we uh, select for Puro to enrich the uh, library containing organoids. And then we perform uh, growth factor withdrawal, such as uh, the wind is very important for the growth. So you can take out wind to see which of the gRNAs can survive. We also tried uh, inhibition of EGF system, EGF signaling, to know uh, which of the ring domain proteins are involved in the EGF pathway. So what is very nice is that uh, once you perform this uh, massive screening, uh, the resulted survivor clones can, can be just collected all together, and you can do uh, the next generation sequencing to see which gRNAs are surviving uh, after this, uh, afterwards. So I'm going to show you the result of uh, wind uh, withdrawal first. So here uh, we had a Cas9 expression organoid, and this is the uh, organoid after a pure selection. And after we remove ice ball from the uh, condition, which makes the uh, wind uh, stimulation very inefficient, uh, most of the organoids were dying, but there were some uh, surviving ones. And when we performed the next generation sequencing of gRNAs, uh, we found that most of the uh, hits are the ones that we actually uh, implanted as a positive control, which are uh, such as exons, APC, that are working in the destruction complex of the wind pathway. Uh, in addition, we also have a, a pair called RNA43 and ZNRH3. Uh, these are the E3 UBC ligates. Uh, that functions on the wind pathway as a negative regulator. So upon the loss of the two, uh, we also know that this uh, endows uh, resistance to responding withdrawal. Uh, interestingly, in orange, you can see that there is a, another noble pair, which is RNF215 and RNF43. So this is the noble discovery we had uh, from the ISPO withdrawal experiment. So we went on uh, validation experiment and here I can show you that uh, the three, the two positive control, XN1 and 2, RNF43 and ZNR3, they both show nice resistance upon ISPO withdrawal. But the noble discovery, which is RNF43 and RNF215, also shows very nice uh, organic growth without ISPO. And this is uh, solely due to the genetic redundancy, because if you uh, separate the guide RNA, to knock out uh, just exin 1 or exin 2, uh, there is no survival, surviving organoid without ISPO. Same goes with RNA43 and ZNRA3. And even the RNA43 and RNA215 pair uh, is the case. So if you simply knock out RNA215 alone, there is no survival at all. So with this, I, uh, I'm sure that I have shown how the uh, GRNA screening is working, and also the importance of thinking about you know, knocking out uh, the parallels at the same time using the dual guide RNA system. So next, I'm going to tell you about uh, uh, EGS pathway screening. So in this case, we utilize a very famous uh, <clears throat> target therapy uh, reagent, Jefetinib, which inhibits the uh, tyrosine kinase activity of EGFR. Uh, with the jafetinib, if you treat it in the uh, normal organoid, within three passages, there is no organoid surviving. Whereas after we introduce the uh, E3 ligase uh, ring domain uh, library um, into the organoid, uh, we were able to see uh, many surviving organoids in passage three, meaning that there is a clearly some surviving organoids with a uh, gRNA. So we then checked the next generation sequencing, and these are the three uh, top candidates. Um, and if I move on, we also tested uh, validate the system. Uh, so here the, the, we found one very strong uh, hit, which is PS1 and 3. So if you knock out the two at the same time, then we found that the organic becomes very resistant to the deficit treatment. So currently, our lab is working on the details of the mechanism to understand 
how and why uh, PS123 knockout can endow uh, the resistance against to the uh, Jefferson treatment. Okay, so this is the uh, end of my uh, presentation. Uh, before finishing the talk, I'd like to have uh, I'd like to emphasize the um, the help that I was getting from GenScript, especially uh, whenever I want to generate a targeting vector or a single strand audience. Uh, I I've been using GenScript service, and uh, you know that's why I uh, got to know the company very uh, closely. And, uh, and then obtained the opportunity to uh, present my work to you today. So that's why I wanted to show you uh, in which way I'm uh, cooperating with GenScript. Uh, next, uh, IMBA is my home uh, institute. And this is a European institute located in Vienna, Austria. And I think it's a, a very nice home for organized researchers. So the institute is currently uh, directed by uh, Professor Jürgen Knoblich, who has established brain organoid for the first time. Uh, I am a junior PI working on other stem cell organoids, and I also have three other colleagues uh, working on uh, blastos, blastoid, uh, cardiac organoids, and blood vessel organoids. So uh, I think that uh, if someone, if there is a young uh, researchers who are interested in uh, organoid biology, I'd like to suggest to think about joining our institute. Uh, with that, uh, I'd like to thank uh, my uh, people in the lab, especially ji Hun Kim, who is carrying uh, currently the uh, CRISPR uh, gRNA project, and also the collaborators, uh, Hyung Bong Kim, for uh, providing the nice dual guide RNA system. Uh, and Hans Travers uh, for mentoring uh, during my uh, post of time and also collaboration afterwards. Thank you for your attention. So if you have any question, I'm happy to uh, take your question and answer those. Thank you, BK, for your informative presentation. We will now start the Q&A portion of the webinar. If you have a question you'd like to ask, please do so now. Just click on the Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for. Okay, let's go ahead and get started. Okay, BK, your first question is, when will the organoids be used in the clinic to treat patients? Yeah, so it's a very uh, good question. Um, so for cell therapy, I think uh, I mentioned uh, during my presentation that one big hurdle for now is uh, finding out a synthetic or some other uh, materials that is qualifying for a good manufacturing uh, procedure uh, to you know, utilize organoids for human trial. So once we know how to grow organoids in a matrix that are fully defined, then we will be able to move in forward. Uh, secondly, uh, organoids can also be used as a uh, assay system. For instance, uh, cancer organoids is currently being considered as a nice uh, sailboat uh, to predict the, um, the patient response upon uh, various uh, chemo reagents or uh, target therapy reagents. So those are uh, going to be realized uh, in the near future so that at some point we may take organoids uh, from our uh, cancer, firstly, to see which of the drugs are the best for my cancer to be treated. And in this way, I think organic can also help uh, human uh, help many patients in the clinic. Great, thank you. Okay, moving on, this says, hi, thank you for sharing your beautiful work. I have a couple of questions. So the first question says, what kind of matrix did you use to embed the organoids? Yeah, so the matrix that we are uh, usually using is uh, called uh, Matrigel, but there are uh, several uh, comparable uh, matrix uh, materials that you can use, such as BME or Cartex. So these are also working pretty well. Uh, there are currently a number of uh, papers out there which shows uh, similar activity with a different substance, uh, but these are still uh, pretty 
preliminary, I would say, it has to be extensively tested by many labs to be uh, used uh, instead of the material-based system. Okay, now the second part of this question says, when you split the organoids, do you digest them to single cells? And if so, what kind of technique and reagents do you use? Okay, so um, I think it might have not been so clear during my talk. So we uh, we do uh, trypsinization uh, only when we do uh, viral infection or uh, DNA electroporation. For normal splitting, uh, we normally just give uh, shear force with a P200. Uh, so yellow tip is just enough to uh, give a shear force. And after pipetting, for instance, uh, 60 times or 100 times, you can make uh, your organoid into uh, small pieces. And these small pieces can directly uh, embed it back to a material. And you know, then you can lay on media to grow them again. So normally, we do not use any, uh, <clears throat> any tracing-like uh, substance for uh, splitting. Thank you. Now, what are the recovery chances of fibrosis through CRISPR? Uh, sorry, I didn't understand the question. Okay, let me repeat the question. It says, what are the recovery chances of fibrosis through CRISPR? Um, yes. Perhaps maybe that user can um, type in a question, maybe elaborate a little bit, and then we yeah, can move on I, to the next and come back to it. Yes, please. Because um, I hear it well, but I couldn't understand what the question is really. Right. It looks like they're wanting to know what are the chances of recovery. Um, recovery. Uh, right. So it, it it depends on the genes that you are. Uh, targeting uh, and also the experiment that you do. So uh, I see I, I have to answer this in two ways. So one is when you just want to make a one mutant with a one gRNA, I think the recovery rate is pretty high uh, depending on the genes. Uh, I think uh, the most important part is uh, your selection strategy. So either your targeting vector has a, a drug selection marker or you know how to select a mutant out. Uh, secondly, uh, in the uh, CRISPR screening that we I just showed, um, when we do the screening uh, with a certain uh, inhibitors to kill the cells, we do not know what are going to uh, survive. So in that case, uh, we have to perform the experiment first to know the recovery rate. Perfect, thank you. Okay, your next question says, um, what percentage of the cells were repaired in the organoid with editing? Uh, so in this case, the editing just needs to be happening in uh, one single cell because, uh, so for instance, when we do CRISPR editing in vivo, uh, the editing uh, efficiency should be very high because every cells that we transfect with the in vivo editing tools, we want to get uh, a proper corrections. Whereas if you do that in the ex vivo, then you just want to find out the correct clone uh, after the editing um, trials. So in that case, I think the uh, efficiency is not really a problem, but once we have a few cells that are correctly targeted as a stem cells, we can grow them out uh, with the organoid media, and afterwards uh, we can test individual clones to see whether they have uh, regained the function. We also can then test whether they have any off-target effect in the genome. And after having performed extensive uh, QC, I think we can then utilize those organoids for cell therapy. Thank you. 
All right, now when comparing retrovirus and lentivirus for transduction in enteroids, which one is better in your opinion? Um, well, many people would prefer to work with lentivirus because they are more familiar to it. Uh, and the reason that uh, lenti is more preferred in general is that you can also uh, infect uh, non-dividing cells. However, in case of the organoids, the stem cells that are need to be infected, they are constantly proliferating. So no matter which one you are using, you can easily achieve uh, infection, and the stem cell will proliferate out to you know, grow organoid, and then the ones a clone is established, you can nicely span them over and over for weeks of culture. So I don't think it is a, uh, a, a you know, some issue to, that you need to think about uh, deeply. So I would go for any of the two. Thank you. Okay, we have time for just a few more questions. So the next question mm -hmm. is, how how big of a library can be used for screening in organoids, and how did you check for the representation of this library? Oh, it's a very good question. So um, there are some pap papers saying that they have achieved a genome-wide uh, library uh, coverage, but I think then uh, uh, you are not introducing just one guide to one cell. So what we found is that uh, with a 10 dish of, uh, with a 10 centimeter, 10 of 10 centimeter dish of organoids, uh, one can cover up to uh, 4,000 gRNAs. So that's the size that we will go from now on. And I think it, is, it will be standardized in such a way. Um, so, yeah, so that's the complexity, and um, could you repeat the question because I forgot something to answer? Sure, let me pull it back up. It says, um, the second part of the question was, how did you check for the representation of the library? Oh yeah, that's very important too. So after performing the infection, uh, we then uh, compare, we then harvest 10% uh, of the infected organoids and isolate GR, the genomic DNA to do uh, PCR over the gRNA. And then we also uh, sent it out for next generation sequencing to see well, what's the coverage. So up to 4,000, uh, we saw that the coverage rate was more than 95%. So that was pretty good. Uh, so we believe that uh, the current, strength, um, current method that we developed is, is probably uh, well optimized for for the 4,000 uh, gRNA diversity. Great, thank you. Okay, so it says for CRISPR applications in mouse organoids, is there any recommendation on whether to use plasmid encoded Cas9 RNA guide or the RNP directly? Um, I think, um, this is actually just a, a, a choice of you. Um, some people like likes to use RNPs uh, more than Cas9 plasmid. Um, just for my lab, we are still using uh, George Church's uh, very first uh, Cas9 uh, plasmid, uh, which has been working very well in our hands. So we haven't really changed our uh, tools to other more fancy ones, uh, but I believe that I saw some very nice applications uh, with a Cas9 RMP in iPS cells, so probably applying those to organoids may enhance the uh, you know, editing efficiency. Thank you. Now, how do you enrich growing deficient single colonies due to KO from others during the screen? Uh, could you repeat the question? Sure. How do you enrich growing deficient single colonies due to KO from others during the screen? Uh...
Yeah, this I, 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 I couldn't understand. Okay, let's go ahead and move on to another question, and we can come back to this one. Yeah. Um, so let's go ahead and let's see. We have so many great questions. Okay, does cystic fibrosis always lead to cancer? Um, no. Uh, so cystic fibrosis uh, actually leads to um, inflammation. So chronic inflammation is the major problem, uh, and then uh, patients, uh, you know, uh, yeah, usually die around the age of uh, 40 or or before. So, um, yeah, I I don't know whether my answer is uh, good enough for the question, but that's what I know. That's great. Thank you. Okay, looks like we have time for just a few more questions. Mm -hmm. And this question says, can the organoid be able to study severe genetic disorders like Turner syndrome? Um, so it depends on uh, what kind of uh, syndrome it is. Uh, so some of the uh, genetic disease that shows uh, very um, the um, uh, pleiotropic uh, phenotype might be not so easy to model both with the organoids. However, if you know uh, a clearly a, <clears throat> a organ that shows the uh, disease phenotype, I believe that organ could be a very nice model system to, uh, to utilize. So I don't think organoid will solve everything. Uh, but it will be very useful uh, if you, you know, know how, where to use it. Great, thank you. Okay, we're going to go ahead and wrap up with this last question. And your last mm -hmm. question is, is there any difference in the gene editing efficiency when you use different parts of the small intestine? Oh, that's interesting. Well, but I... I personally have not uh, compared the gene editing efficiency in those three uh, different segments of the small intestine. So, uh, well, this is a question I cannot really answer. So sorry about that. Well, thank you, BK, for your time today. And do you have any final comments for our audience before we go? Uh, well, I think all the questions that I got today was very uh, interesting and exciting to answer. So I think that I have um, given uh, my presentation well enough. Uh, I hope everybody has, has, has enjoyed it. And uh, thank you again for uh, attending this uh, seminar. Thank you very much. Thank you. And before we go, I'd like to thank the audience for joining us today and for their questions. Any questions we did not have time for today will be addressed by the speaker via the contact information you provided at the time of registration. We would like to thank you, BK, for your time today and for your important research. We would also like to thank Labroot and our sponsor, GenScript, for underwriting today's educational webcast. This webcast can be viewed on demand and Labroots will alert you when it's available for replay. Until next time, goodbye.